problem. So we'll, we'll discuss some of this, the differences and stuff like that. I'm just kind of going through some of the uh, different requirements and regulations that cover each different type. So in a switchboard, we, uh, we have individually mounted devices or what we call group mounted. We call it group because all the breakers are pretty much in, in the same enclosure, grouped together, no separation. Where switch gear, now this is, this happens to be a, a what we call an individually uh, mounted or right? compartmentalized switchboard, but it kind of applies the same same standards as the switchboard above. Ooh, what am I doing? Must be hitting the wrong thing. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, switch gear, ANSI rated. Uh, the big difference between this is uh, all the compart different compartments are isolated from one another. So that's, I got some more pictures that show, but the reason it's deep is because the first, the front part of the gear is the breaker compartment. That's where the circuit breakers are mounted. Separated behind that is the bus compartments, and then separated behind that is the cable compartments where all the terminations are made. Isn't it moving? I'll get you in a minute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, again, ANSI equipment used for large industrials, utilities, maybe even hospitals for main services, anywhere that power is critical. Uh, 600 volt equipment and below. Again, ANSI has some equipment performance requirements that are much higher than what we'd see in switchboards. Some of these are just generic. And I want to get into the actual meat. Okay, so here's some of the differences uh, between the break, different types of breakers that are used. Uh, and again, this is an ANSI. Anywhere from eight to five thousand amp strength breakers, uh, thirty to eighty-five thousand amps, uh, two hundred k. They say with fuses, it's a little outdated. Now we can do two hundred thousand amps of bulk current uh, without uh, implementing fuses. Uh, the biggest difference here is in AMC gear, all the equipment has to be rated for thirty cycles, so it has to handle the entire fault for a minimum of a half a second. Where the switchboards, a lot of times we say it's a three cycle device. So within three cycles that breaker is going to open. It's not designed, it's not heavy enough to handle a fault and keep locked in for the same amount of time that we uh, employ uh, our ANSI breakers. They're also, they're, they can both be stored energy and stored energy means um, the breakers uh, got internal springs and you actually have to pump these springs up, charge them, and then at that point you can either open or close the breaker from the front. And what's the best way to... The other big difference between ANSI breakers and the breakers we use with switchboards are ANSI type breakers have to be fully maintainable. In other words, you can physically rip them apart and replace arc shoots, contacts, you know, any component within that breaker it, is supposed to be or rebuildable. Uh, the breakers look really close between these, but our UL uh, uh, 489 breakers that use a switchboard are uh, uh, insulated case. In other words, they're molded case breaker. You can't split them apart. You can't maintain them where the ANSI breakers actually can be split and maintained. Sorry. That's good. Um, <coughs> there's some other differences that I'm not going to get into, but for the most part, you know, your ANSI breaker is, is much more rugged, much more durable maintainable than a, than a 
the CO49 version that we use in switch stainless switchboards. Uh, I just want to cover the breakers quickly because that, that is one of the main differences between switch gear and switchboard construction. Um, can you get me to the next uh, slide? Two pages. Yeah. Okay. Here's another big difference is operation, mechanical, electrical, and um, The ANSI breaker, um, especially when you get the, the bigger frame, uh, 12,500 open and close operation, where the UL version is only 3,000. So again, much more rugged breaker than you would see in standard switchboard design. The other difference <coughs> is ANSI gears draw out design on the breakers. Um, and what we mean by that, and I wish I could have brought a structure in and stuff, but they're pretty big, um, is there's actually a crank on the front of the breaker you insert into the cell. And as you crank, that breaker actually draws out of the cradle. And there's multiple connect, uh, positions connected. It's actually attached to the bus. All the terminal blocks are attached. You know, the breaker is ready to function. Uh, you draw it out to the next step. Now we're in test where the breaker physically is, is detached from the main cross bus, but all the controls and stuff are still connected. So you can still operate the breaker, open, close it, test it that way, but it functionally is not going to be connected to the to the power bus. Then we get to the disconnected point, and that's where both the terminal block and the power is disconnected. The breaker is still in the cell, the door is still closed. And then the fourth position is removed. So at that point, the breaker, the door is open, and you physically can remove the breaker out of the cell. That's the that's the four positions for a draw breaker. <coughs> if I go ahead, two things get into effect. Yep. This is very important just for safety because Absolutely. now you have yeah, as you just mentioned a few <coughs> things because now you can disconnect the circuit breakers without being exposed to the arc flash. If there's any arc flash, you are there is a sheet there, there's metal between you and uh, an arc flash. Right. Up until the point. Where we get to this, the remove obviously, then the door is open and you're physically removing the breaker from the cell. But before that, the door is closed, the breaker is still guarding you from any arc flash that could occur. Uh, now, with square D, we actually have a white paper that we say as long as you're, so all the doors are closed and you lock it up to the, you know, to the gear just to operate a breaker. We classify that as category zero. Yeah. And I think we're about the only manufacturer that that actually will state that. We do have a white paper we give to industrials and stuff. So you can close the breaker, basically dressed up like you and I, yep. you know, with blood. As long as the doors are closed, you know, all the barriers are on, and you're going to close that breaker or open it, you can walk up to it dressed up. You may, it may be category one. You may, depending on the amount of energy yeah, that's yeah. there, you may have to wear cotton. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. It's but, that's but that's that's no about shield, it. no. No. Nope. That actually writes us uh, quite a few jobs with industrials because um, a lot of our competitors won't just won't write that letter. That letter. Um, so th these are just some basics. I was hoping. I could get into some pictures. Okay, so again, switch gear, narrower but deeper, requires front and rear access. Switchboards, shallower but wider, and they can be set up as front access only, so they can be pushed against the wall. Yeah, there you go. So on that picture to the left. Yep, go back. That to me looks like the front, but it doesn't look like there's access. This is front. This is a piece of equipment right here. It's kind of hard to see, but there is actual space. And when we say rear access, it depends on the voltage. 
you, you may require three feet behind there, three and a half feet, uh, depending on what type of a wall it is. If it's block or if it's, you know, some type of insulated material, then you can get down into three feet, okay? Um, again, here's what we call cells, right? Uh, this is a breaker cell to break or remove. You see the bus tabs back here? And that's what the break, when you rack that breaker in, it's got fingers that actually attach to that bus. And um, there'd be a spot down here where that crank I was talking about goes into. And that's physically, when you're turning that, it's physically screwing that in or, or, or out, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, this is the old style airframe breaker we used to use. Uh, but it kind of gives you an idea. This is obviously removed, so the doors open and we physically pull that breaker out. And I, I don't know if I got any good pictures, but normally when you do that, there's a crane that runs across the top of the gear that you can run back and forth. And physically, it's got a hook on it. So you can lower it down, hook it on the breaker, and then pick it up off of these rails. And then you put a cart under it, lower it down, and then, you know, but again, you, you can see these breakers are maintainable. You can rip them apart. Totally maintainable. Okay. Depends. Uh, some of the bigger breakers could be 150, 200 pounds. Uh, some of the smaller breakers, 180 pounds. Really depends, but it's not something that you might by yourself try and pick up and, and carry. So uh, that's why they have the overhead hoist in uh, the carts to move them around. Okay, so here's kind of a side view. Kind of has some of the barriers and stuff removed, but this is this gear, and that's this is what I was talking about being separated. This front area in here is where the actual breaker is located and where that cell is with all the bus. This, this middle section in here, it's really hard to see, and I apologize, but that's where the actual cross bus is, the main cross bus is located. And that's what distributes the power throughout the gear. And then this back section is where the lugs are actually located. So you got standoffs shooting back from the breaker, and this is where all your cable connections are made. So again, depending on the piece of gear, you know, there's many options for barriers, but you could have barriers, side barriers in the cable compartments, side barriers in the bus compartment, barriers between the cable and bus compartment. And if you apply all those, then when somebody goes into the back and opens up that door, all they're going to be exposed to are the cables, the load cables from that section. So if all the breakers are opened in that section and you open it off, everything should be dead back there. So a little safer to work on, uh, especially for maintenance purposes. And again, with all these barriers, obviously, uh, and if you have the side cable barrier, now you're not exposed to all the cables and terminations of the sections beside it. Where this type of gear, you open that up, it's, again, really hard to see, but I mean, the cross bus, you're exposed to everything that's in that piece of gear. So as soon as you take a front cover off, you know, breaker terminations, cross bus, everything is just sitting right there in front of you. So much safer to maintain and work with than, than this product. Much more expensive. And uh, again, it takes up a lot more space as far as depth is concerned because you have to have, it's normally 72 inches deep, so six feet deep, plus you need front and rear access. Where these, depending on the amp capacity, anything 2,500 amps and below is 24 deep. When you get to 3,000, then it's 36, and then 4,000 is 48. But again, we can design it so it's all acceptable from the front. You can slap it against it. Any questions? And again. 
breaker is segregated from the, the other. Each one has its own cradle, its own you know area that it that's associated with it. Everything else is barriered off, so you're only exposed when you open that door to that one breaker. And then our, again, you take a cover off of our group mounted, you're exposed to every breaker that's in that section. And the idea here is, is if you have a short circuit or a wound bolt in one section, and the fire is not going to spread right through the switch gear and join right. the, the, the neighboring section. Correct. So. No, deep, wide, and shallow. So, coordination wise, I don't know if you get, if you're getting into. We do, we do our scan. Okay. We did get lost. Right. Okay, so, and th this is getting gray, okay, nowadays, because um, before it was these ANSI breakers, you could turn off the, it was the only breaker you could turn the instantaneous on, okay? And once you did that, the breaker had to be able to, you know, those 85,000 amp rated breakers, it had to take 85,000 amps for 30 cycles to help the <coughs> part. So you can imagine how rugged these breakers have to be built to handle something like that. And then it, it used to be that the breakers were used in the switchboards um, were, like I said, like a three cycle breaker. It had to handle the, the fault long enough for it to clear. But it was going to clear right away. Um, nowadays, um, because of the selective coordination requirements and stuff, even some of our molded case breakers can handle a fault. You can turn off the instantaneous, and the breaker will hold in for a lot longer than it used to. Um, and there's some issues with code about turning off the instantaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you cover that or not. With our breakers, it's not really an issue because there's still an override built into it. So even if you turn off the instantaneous, it's not really turned off. It's just brought to a much higher level. So then it might be 38,000 amps. So the, the, if the fault current gets above that, the breaker's going to trip the point away anyway. But it does give you the ability to coordinate a lot better than you were able to in the past. So again, ANSI breakers. 30 cycles. Um, even some of our insulate case breakers that we use in standard switchboards have 30 cycle capability. It's not necessarily as high as I am. And then even our, our molded case breakers that are group mounted, some of them can handle quite a bit of current for quite a few cycles. How about the equipment downstream? It's always the equipment, like the panels, the buffers. Right. Um, with the, the panels. Mm -hmm. And, and the whole reason for this and the switchboards is to give those panels time to, to clear the fault, right? So they're still trying to go instantaneously. Like right now, we're just giving them the ability to try and clear that fault before it propagates farther up. Um, so our switchboards, yes, believe it or not, we do have some withstand tests we've done mm -hmm. in our switchboards for uh, the buses. So the withstand of the panel will be 18 cycles or 30 cycles? No, well that's just in the switchboard, right? Okay. The breakers in the panel board are going to try and take out right switch. away. Just switchboard. Right. Gotcha. So. What will give you a room to coordinate? A lot of room to coordinate. Um, and if you use an SKM, at least with our R frame breakers, our P frame breakers and stuff, you know, where it says instantaneous and you pick 2 to 10 or whatever it is, 2 to 15. If you click on the instantaneous and read down, you can actually, there's an off you can select. So, like an RG off, mm -hmm. you pick that, and all of a sudden the curve, you know, you used to only be able to adjust that breaker to this point. Now we've got way over 38,000. So, as long as your fault current downstream gears and above that, we coordinate. Jerry, how do you solve that? Like in 2011, they came up with you disabled instantaneous. You have to have a button to overwrite it, or you have to have the first. Well, that's what I was talking about. The first right? wheel is. Or we, um, do you circuit breaker have a maintenance, maintenance switch where you can turn the instantaneous on, work on it, safer than turning off, leave, coordinate? We do have. 
like I said, we can turn our instantaneous off, but you're not really turning it off. You're, yeah, you're it's got that it override yeah. built in. So that part of the code doesn't apply to our bravery. There are some manufacturers where off is off, and, and it's just short time at that point. There's no protection to that breaker, and that's why they 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 introduce that code requirement, right, to have differential relaying or something mm. at that point. Our breakers off doesn't necessarily mean off; it just means the override is built in to move that curve way over to the right. Okay, so we don't have to worry about that with our breakers. And that's what I was talking about. Some the code changes, yeah. right? Effective. Off isn't necessarily off. Yeah. Some manufacturers it is. And yeah, the way you should be all the way off. Right. So we do have a maintenance switch capability um, so that you can turn it to maintenance mode. And at that point, basically all the settings pretty much reduce down to minimum. And then your your exposure categories in that one or two areas. I, I'm, if it's a service entrance gear, though, you're still dangerous. In standard switchboard construction, anyway, yeah. because that whole the bus is wide open in the back, so that fault could propagate through yeah. the entire lineup. So if the the, line, the problem is the cables on incoming. The only protection they have is on the medium voltage side of that transformer. Yeah. Right? And if there's a fault that occurs there, this breaker, the main breaker, won't see that fault. It won't won't react. It's a device that's on the other side of that transformer mm -hmm. on the medium voltage side that's got to take that fault out. And that's why you're automatically, if it's a service entrance, you're automatically pretty much dangerous. Now by applying arm switches to the branch breakers in that gear, now you're reducing the arc flash and all the downstream channels and stuff that it's feeding, but you're still dangerous over here because you're, and that's with switchboards. Now I think with switch gear, the, the, with everything compartmentalized and barriered, mm -hmm. at that point, you, if you put an arm switch on the main, now your ratings and all the downstream devices is probably low. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work at switchboards. The only way to fix that is to remote mount that main. Either outside or you know, put the main here in a cable to the distribution over here. Because then once you turn off that main, or dial that main down. Now, now that would work because there's physical separation. The problem has always been the line side of the circuit breaker. Line side. That's the issue. It's, it's right. the arc flash. When you guys did the arc flash with me last quarter, and we did, and we came up with category 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, if you have a switch gear, the arc flash rating of a switch gear is based on the line side of the circuit breaker, not the load side. Because the arc could be on the line side, then, like you said, then you're protected by Excel if it's service. Right. They have no control over what they said they're really is. Correct. So you don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And with special with three closers, I think it's even yeah. worse. Because they can close, close on. three times, yeah. and the fault just keeps getting worse and worse every time they close. Um, so now that I've bored and confuse people completely. So um, I didn't mean to no, no, no. That's get you out of I just wanted to explain the differences between, you know, what's the difference between switch gear and switchboard construction? So the biggest deal is segregation. Switch gear is totally segregated. Each breaker has its own cubicle that's buried off from every, every other breaker. Um, there's separate compartments for the main busing and their barrier from the rest of the, from the breakers or the cable compartment. And then in the back, you have the cable compartment that's buried off from everything else there. So, and the whole gist of it is to try and control the propagation of faults and arcs through the gear and protect people. The other issue, you know, the, the switch gear is withstand rated. 
for 30 cycles. So it's got to handle that fault current for 30 cycles without exploding. And switchboards are what we call AIC rated or, or three cycle rated. So they have, it'll take the fault out within three cycles to protect itself. And then the breakers are maintainable, breakers are not maintainable. Any questions? Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Busway, and then we'll get the products out of the way, and then we'll talk a little bit about the project and uh, transfer pairs and you know how everything works there. So this is Busway. I don't know if you guys have ever actually seen it, but this this is an actual piece of Busway that you mount across the top of your room. This is where the connections are made. This is where they tie together. There'd be like a, a joint pack that slides in here, and then the other piece with a bolt that you tighten down to, to connect it, and then it, then you go to the next piece. Uh, normally sold in 10-foot sections, but we can build special pieces to within an inch, and it it gets to that point, you know, especially if you're running long bus runs and you have to go down this hallway, turn the corner, up over the water pipes, back down, across, you know, I mean some of these get really complicated and takes a lot of measurement. Um, this is like 600 amp busway. The nice thing about busway is this height is pretty much standard. It's just that a 3000 amp busway would be this tall but probably this wide, so it gets wider for us. But the height and the general construction is pretty much the same. And this happens to be plug-in busway, and the reason we call it plug-in is because it's got openings every two feet on either side where you can plug a, a, a unit on. And this happens to be just a 30 amp fusible plug-on unit cranks down and then there's this little unit back here that you screw to attach it to the bus and they hold it on tight. It looks like a safety switch on the inside. Like the one in the wall. Oh, yep. Absolutely. So there's different types of busway, just based on its applications. We have a feeder busway that doesn't have any plug-in openings, and it's just like K1 conduit. It's just to get power from this point to that point. Okay, so if you have a main switchboard down in the basement, right, 3,000 amps, and then you've got a 2,000-amp uh, switchboard in the penthouse 40 floors above, we would use feeder busway just to run that distance to get the power up there. And um, the reason that they look at busway in some of those applications versus K1 conduit is it's a heck of a lot easier to install this stuff than on those long runs. It's more expensive a lot of times than K1 conduit, but the labor for install is about half the cost. So there's a sweet spot in there where you know, if it's this big, this many amps, and you're going that far, it's pretty much cheaper to, to use busway than the cable conduit. And then, obviously, we have the plug-in style, which I think is what you're using on your project. Yep. Right? So we would put a tap box on the end of this thing, and all it is is it plugs onto there, but it gives you lugs to attach to power up the busway. And then you run that busway, you know, the 40 or 60 or whatever feet, and then plug your units where you need them, cable down to whatever equipment you're trying to operate, and away you go. And the reason people do this versus cable and conduit is this is much more flexible, especially on processes where you have to move equipment around, you know, or different batches, you use different equipment. Um, this is extremely easy to pull the plug off here, move it over there, plug it back on, refeed that piece of equipment. Um, so 
That's the main reason why people will use bus stops. Well, they might be generally bumped open, or they have covers over them when they cover them. The plug-in units? Yeah. No, they have a, a cover. This is old. <laughs> there's there's actually a point here where there's there used to be a hinge in the door that's closed, right? And then you open the door, and then the plug-on snaps in. Yep, okay. correct. This is four wire. Um, if you're re if you're feeding like mainly motor loads and stuff like that that don't need a neutral, we do make it in a three wire product too. So copper, aluminum, three wire, four wire. This is aluminum. Yes, I didn't want a piece of copper bus with this really heavy. <laughs> um, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, if you guys want to look at this, it's not space, you know, science, but, or rocket science, but it's, um, it's kind of cool, and the process that we use to make it's kind of cool. Um, but this, I think, how many runs? Two runs on your project, if I read it right? Yeah, we have two, we have 480 system, bus for 480, so what, we're, what we always did is we took the 480 all the way to the switch gear, and okay. we fit it directly from the switch gear. Okay. You know, see so you're going to bus right up the to the switch gear. So we'll take yeah. from the, because they're very close to each other, directly from the switch gear all the way to the manufacturing floor with 480. Uh, and then that would be the feeder. And then we'll, we'll have... Uh, divvy up from there? Yeah, divvy up from there. Okay. And then we have another one too, 28120. Okay. Now the 28120, since we have a transformer, what we're going to do exactly what you did is we have a, a box at the end and feed it from a transformer. Okay. Um, let's see, I don't know how to get to, what do you want to get to? Um, I brought, just, I downloaded some brochures okay. for the product. I'll get you there, do you want to get to the network? No, it's on that, di on this flash drive. Okay, no problem. I figured it would be easier that way. I couldn't find where your, my computer was, so I was having a little problem. <laughs> Which one do you uh, it would be the Pease, uh, Busway Catalog. Here. This one right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you can use the mouse if you okay. want to I'll steal your mouse then. Um, now this just this general picture right here. Again, <clears throat> this may be your feeder busway that you're coming out of the gear and get into the location that you want to go. And then at that point, we can transition to plug-in. They'll bus right up together. You don't have to do anything special. They, they would look darn near identical, except that this one actually has plug-in openings and this one wouldn't, OK? Uh, we do make elbows, T's. Um, how many amp is the busway in this one? We have I don't remember. 1,000 amp, one of them, and what was the other one? 600. What is it? 600. 600. You know the, the, the bus wave. I thought the bus wave was not that. 1,600. So we have 1,600. Okay. And these are the joints I was talking about. Basically, you know, this is the, the bolts and the washers that hold that joint pack together. And that joint pack just slides between the two buses. And the nice thing about our our joint packs is, is there's this nut here and this little tag. But there's another nut underneath that. So all you have to do is put your wrench on there and just twist it until the thing snaps off. And at that point, it's torqued properly. So dumb poop. Dumb poop. So if you're walking along and you see these, and these are yellow, bright, if you're walking along and you're looking down the busway and you see one of these, you know that joint hasn't been tightened. Mm -hmm. you got a problem. So uh, a lot of people like that feature of our busway. Um, Jury, the frame is the equipment running conductor, right? Correct. Yeah, this, so this frame we use as a ground. And what do you know the uh, the frame is you don't need to pull an equipment around a conductor or it's another box. It's a fifty percent ground frame. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, you don't have to pull a separate ground. And when this unit plugs on, it makes the attachment and, and grounds itself basically. So you got a ground bar and here's a tap. Okay. How often do you pull in neutral? Again, it depends. Um, you know what we're feeding. If we're going up a high rise yeah, yeah, and we're yeah. feeding electrical closets with uh, lighting panels in it, well, then, you, the then you're running neutrals all the time. The feeding equipment typically they're three phase, a three phase, three wire, and you know if they need a lot of times it could be just three wire, yeah, three buses. Mm -hmm. So the, the choices on busway, I guess, is a voltage. You know, is it 240? Is it 480? Is it 600 volt? Is it three wire? Is it four wire? Is it copper or is it aluminum? And then the fault current, because we do have different buses raised for different it's fault currents. And here's this one doesn't. This one is missing that plastic piece there. But this is the plastic piece that the, the unit plugs into to make the connection. And I just wanted to show you we have elbows, horizontal elbows, vertical elbows. Um, it sounded like you were going to tee off. This again is the feet, there's a plug in busway. You can see the opening there. And then here's our feeder busway with no openings. They look identical. Here's 3R busway. Uh, again, it looks similar, but the joints have this cover. It's all gasketed. Keeps out the moisture. So. This is a good catalog. So how does that do like the phase transposition? Okay, well that's that's one of the things, right? Um, you have to be smarter than the project when you're doing this takeoff. When we're doing the original takeoff, it's easy. You just go how many feet from point A to point B, and how many elbows do we need, or T's or whatever, and you just put it in the system and it prices it up. It's when you get the order that <laughs> that it becomes much more uh, complicated because say the switchboard's on the basement facing this way and the piece of equipment you're feeding up on the four floors over here feeding this way well now you got ABC 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 you know so you have to make sure that this piece of gear is built right CBA N and versus NABC here as a connection so that the phasing is built right there are pieces, we do have some special pieces when the sales guy screws it up and doesn't get it right, um, but they're big and, and uh, expensive, but it's a phase transition piece. So it's a big box basically where we're, we're basically making a cable connection between the buses and, and changes our phasing within that box. Um, so Jerry, when you start with ABC top to bottom, mm -hmm. at one location you always end up with ABC. Uh, not necessarily. Well, okay, okay, we're ABC mm -hmm. here, right? Yeah. We're coming up this way. Now also we see. turn this so way. When you turn in, inside the panel, isn't that your and listing require you to have right to left ABC? Or I mean, how do you? Or you play with it? It's all the, played with up here in that yeah, connection, up in that flange okay. connection. Okay. Yep. I see. So the final destination will be right. what, top to bottom, right, left to right, or front to back, ABC. Right. right. The good thing for you guys is you just have to show us how to where we need to go with the busway. It's on us, and after that, to make sure we get the phasing right and we build it correctly. It's involved. It's involved a lot. Mm -hmm. It's very involved, especially on some jobs. Now this is a tap box, right? That I was talking about. So it's just a big box that goes on the end, and then it's got, you know, your lights, A, B, C, N. So you probably want one of those on this job for the 208 for the stuff, 208 right? System, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is the smaller busway. This is the 225 to 600 amp. 
so it's, it's a little bit different. Here's a T. Whoops, what did I do? Okay. Here's a T connector. You get, uh, you come to a point and you split off. And I don't know. You were saying something once you get in that with the bigger busway. Once you get in the room, and you want to split. What the requirement right now is to drain the feeder, and then you have to have a circuit breaker and heat section. Oh, okay. So, you so you're not teeing off and then no, running. Because okay. the feeder will be like I think a 1,000 amp feeder, and then you tab 225 this, 225 that, and okay. you keep tabbing um, into it. There's one behind you right here. You see that um, yellow? The yellow is 225, the blue is the feeder, so I think 1,000 amp or something. Okay. Right. So you're still going to employ T's here. Yeah, 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 for, for the feeder, yep. So okay. just so you know, there's T's, there's elbows. Um, when we get to the big equipment, and so this is on your computer now, so you, you have all the okay. information. Thank you. Um, well, it's on your flash drive. I'll make sure it's in the network too. So then. Right. Um, if you have to penetrate a wall, this catalog will tell you, okay, depending on how many amps, this is how big the opening has to be. Installation manual. Yep. This has got everything that you would ever want to know about busway. Again, like I said, you know, depending on the capacity, they're all the same height. They just get wider for the busway. The reason for the sandwich the millennium to keep the space is just to get rid of the heat. Let's look at the how the you mean actual here? yeah, the actual buses are not taking a whole lot of room with the mm -hmm. whole there's some heat rise that yeah. you have to deal with. Right. Okay. And the bigger the intensity, we go up to four thousand amp bus. Uh, this is aluminum. And this little chart will tell you how many pounds per foot the bus weigh? Like 4,000 amp aluminum is close to 40 pounds a foot. Uh, and it's that's for three pole, and four pole is 40 pounds. Um, and then the difference between plug in and feeder. Copper. And that's for 3,000. 5,000 amp is 72 pounds a foot for three full and 90 pounds for. We're talking some heavy stuff. If you're dealing with a 10 foot piece, it's basically 1,000 pounds. And this information, guys, is very important because we need to give this one to the structural engineer. Right. So they can take into consideration when they build the structures for the building. You're going to be mounting in from their ceilings, structural ceilings, so that's a big deal mounting this heavy equipment. Okay, so somewhere in here also is the voltage drop information, resistance, all that stuff's in here. Okay, and this is a flange. This is what we put in the top of our gear that the busway would connect to when you're busting right out of the gear directly. Um, again, you guys don't have to necessarily worry about this. You know, our plant would install that and it would be ready to go for you to plug your bus way into. We do provide all this information for the local tin vendors like AMP or EMI or states that might be using our flange and install for the year. They need a lot of information to, for, you know, to make sure they build their gear right to accept our flange. Here's some busing information, all that stuff. This is uh, this is more what the flange looks like. Sticking on the top of the gear. We do tell you how big an opening it needs to be and all that stuff. So pretty good piece of document, but it's huge. Lots of pages. <clears throat> Are all the buses rated to 600 amp, 600 volts, and then use them in the system? Or do they pay? Pretty much, yeah. yeah. You know, and again, you know, different types of elbows, depending if you have to turn this way or go up. Um, offset pieces for when you don't have enough room for two separate elbows, because, you know, we can only build them a certain dimension. You can actually build these offsets with much tighter turns. <clears throat> again, if you have to go around water pipes or heat vents or 
something. So here's a couple more funky. This one's to go up and over. So I just want to make sure you guys knew or saw, you know, what type of stuff we do make. Um, I was looking for that trans expansion fittings. That's a big deal in the industrials. So anytime you're across an expansion joint in a building, you gotta make sure you provide one of these because it lets the lets the busway move with the building. So if you didn't do that, your bus could pull apart at that point. So it's just something to think about. This requirement is one you never know when you move to a structural expansion. So it has always been an industry, but they might be added. Right. So this one you know. There's your T's. Different types of feeds, service heads, transformer, caps. Um, this one's for if you got three single phase transformers. Again, it gives you floor opening requirements. Um, here's your trans phase transition. Again, it's kind of big and it costs a lot of money, so you try and make sure you get your phasing right when you, the first time when you're doing the takeoff. Otherwise, uh, it could cost you a boatload of money and all sorts of different hangers. Any questions? Sorry if I'm boring the heck mm -hmm. out of you. Um, so now, I'm kind of just going to uh, get to the white white book. Yeah. <clears throat> hey, who needs a break? We're doing okay? Can we take five minutes? It's up take to you. Minutes. Do you mind? No, I think I it's giving the trees a little bit. While you were loading this one. Let's take five minutes, guys, a little bit. In general, a switch gear section. Oops. No, I'm just putting, giving you more room oh, okay. to draw. Again, we talked about you know switch gear being kind of thin and deep. Uh, Three thousand amp breaker will fit in a twenty-two inch wide section. Same with anything below that. When we get to a four thousand or five thousand amp breaker, we're going to do a thirty-six wide section. And normally, a three thousand amp is a is a what we call a double size breaker. In other words, it takes up two cubicles in the gear. So this would be our 3,000 inch main. And if you have metering or TDSS or SPD, I should say, these things that um, would probably be mounted in this section in one of these empty cubicles. <clears throat> then we go into the distribution section. And they're segregated into four cubicles, A, B, C, D. And each one of the cubicles will accept, you know, you can normally, depending on the depth of the board, if it's standard 72, you can uh, definitely put four 1,600 amp breakers in a section. Um, Possibly 2,000 amp, but we might have to force it to seven feet deep. And it's all because of wire bending space. You know, because the deeper we go, the more cable space in the bottom. Because the, the breaker compartment, the bus compartment, are always static. They're a certain depth. When we start adding that extra depth, we're basically making our cable compartment at the back deeper. So, again, for sure 1,600 amp, we can stack four in a session. When you get to 2,000, we might be able to put two 2,000s and two 16s or something like that. It's just, if you need two, you, your job's not going to be that good. Right? All the feeders are listed 1,600. 1,600. The feeders, yeah. The okay. main is going to be 4,000. So this is basically going to be your layout then. And it's going to be. We have two gens that's going right. to be taking one section, I believe. It's going to be 
72 inches deep. You know, 91 and a half high. And is that 3,000 inch survey? Yeah. Okay. 4,000. It was four. Okay, so how do I reverse that? Yep, right here. Yeah, we have. So this will probably be 36, 22, and then if you need five breakers or eight, it doesn't matter. We're going to add another section under that. Okay, so that kind of gives you the general gist. And again, this first part here is where your, your breakers are. You know, that's the cell where the breaker is installed. And then we have a section in the middle, and that's where your main cross bus, whoopsie. That's okay, bro. Yeah, where your main cross bus would run. And then this whole area in the back is, is where your cables will connect. So, did you want to save that? Pretty piece of service. Right. So, go so next. Yeah. It's kind of ugly. Okay, so just in general, you know what this switch would look like. Uh, now, let's talk about a little bit about your, your project, right? Because you're going to have a utility feed. Can I, um, yeah? Can I show you the riser? Do you mind? No, that's fine. Yeah, so the kind of an example of the riser. Where is it still here? Um, my testing here. I'd like to add some sticks here. It would be more optimum to have your bus coming to, to the top normally. Well, normally when down. we're getting a feed from the utility and generator, it's cable conduit. So it's normally underground. And you can't run a bus right underground. Um, so normally the incoming is going to be cable, and then at that point, and that it will get confusing. Uh, you may want to contact me when you're laying out the gear. If you have a bunch of busway runs, there's only so many busways we can run out of a top of a section. So normally it's like maybe two. You can stack up again before we even do it. But if you get if you start getting more busway runs, then we may get more sections, not just because of how many breaks you have, but because of how many busway connections we can make, you know, using the stuff. I'm saying a maximum of two busways out of eight sections. Right. In general. Um, I've got them to tag more than that, but it gets really complicated at that point. And, and then your lead time from the gear goes way out because it's special engineered. And, so in general, you can normally fit two up top. So here's the um, kind of the general, and you can go on that one. I okay. can go up a little bit. This this is how the riser is. That's pretty. It's, That's pretty. Well, there's, there's <laughs> we're doing it different. It's different. We have two generators, transformer, utility, termination box coming to the switch gear, and okay. feeding all mechanical panels, two transformer receptacle panels. We have a UPS. System somewhere here okay. with two PBUs. Then it switches and feeds the bus stops here. Yep. Another bus stop to a transformer, a chiller, and an auto transport okay. switch to an inner, maybe to panel. That's kind of what the, what we're looking at. Okay. To I don't know if you want to mention any. I can make it bigger. That's fine. Um. So. Is the switch working on Ontario? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Switchboard, like. Standard, if it's 2,500 amps or less, it's 24. When you get to 3,000, it's 36. 4,000, it's 48. And then I think when you get to 5,000 amps, it gets to 54, 50. So <coughs> this stuff is normally 72 deep. That's standard. You, you may have to make it deeper again, depending on. How many and what size of breakers you have in a section? You know, it's all it's all wire bending first, so basically it's the depth. <coughs> okay, so guy was from Mashad said that we're going to do transfer pairs on this project instead of using 
transfer switches. Um, so plus transfer pairs, we, these breakers are electrically operable. In other words, they, they, they come standard manually. You know, okay, go back to the, the other view that I just thought to show. Yep. Okay. okay. Let's flip together. Um, well, what I'm talking about is I'll just draw you. But, but basically, on a breaker, you know, if you want it electrically operated so you can remotely control it to open and close it, all you need to do is add a shunt close coil and a shunt open coil and then a spring charging motor. And all that spring charging motor does is, you know, you only get so many operations out of a charge. You know, I said you had to pump the breaker up because it's got internal springs. And open, close, open, would at that point, the spring would be discharged and you can op the operate the breaker again until you discharge that spring. So what we would provide is just a spring charging motor that every time the spring discharges, it would automatically charge the spring up again. So it's ready to go. And then the shunt close, you energize the shunt close, and it would trip the breaker to close it. And if you hit the shunt open, it would trip the breaker to open it from a remote source. Um, and that's the basis of using breakers for shunt, for transfer pairs. There would be some type of control. Um, so we could do it, or the generator manufacturer could do it. You know, for parallel control. And at that point, <clears throat> you know, we're running, we're chugging along out the utility. The utility breaker is closed. All the generator breakers are open. Okay. Utility leaves. We have sensor, you know, like voltage sensing relays that would, all its job is, is to verify what the voltage on the line side of that breaker is. If it starts dropping, over a certain amount of time, that will automatically send a start signal to the generator and trip the utility brake open. Okay, now what's happening in the meantime, the generator is starting up. We're pretty much out of power at that point, right? The place is in the dark. You got your UPS, it was your backup power. So it's batteries take over at that point. So anything that's fed off the UPS stays energized. The rest of the billing's in the dark. <coughs> Generator one comes up to speed and voltage. System will close that breaker under the bus. Now it waits for the second generator to get up to voltage, speed, and when it gets into sync with this one, in other words, the waveforms of both of them are tracking, it'll close the second generator onto that bus. So now we're totally on generator power at that point. So now, all of a sudden, utility power comes back on. The system recognizes there's utility power. Now there's two options. Are we doing an open transition or a closed transition transfer? OK, so we're doing a closed transition. So at that point, the utility breaker is looking at the generators now, kind of like Gen 1 and Gen 2 were. And waiting until everybody's in sync on that waveform, and then we'll close the gener the utility breaker in. And once the utility breaker is on, then we will start dropping off the generator so that there's not a bump. There's always a bump going to the generators because we lost power. Um, but if there's there's uh, two different ways. Open transition means you're basically shut the generators off, and then you close the utility. Well, then you get a bump going back the other way, a blip. You lose power for a certain amount of time. And then the closed transition is the one I was talking about. We're watching the generators, you know, and they're out of sync. And then all of a sudden, there's a point where the waveforms are in sync. We'll close the utility. So now we're on utility power, and then we'll take the generators offline, and we haven't lost power to the customer. Customer has no idea. So that's the difference between open and closed transition. And then, um, <clears throat> I mean, some of the generator manufacturers might do a, a, a soft load, soft loading transfer. And that's mainly so 
if you're going from utility to gen power, and this is for like load preservation or load shed, you know, where you're actually generating with utility, um, or utility calls and says, you have to get off the grid. Okay, at that point, they may just go on the generator, and even though utility power is there, they may go off the utility and just go to the generator because they'll get a better rate from utility. That's not necessarily what's going on in your project, but I'm just trying to explain all the different things that we, that we do. At that point, <clears throat> instead of just dropping the utility and going to gens, that's a big jolt on these generators when they're doing that. They might they do something called a soft load transfer where they they're slowly bringing generators up to speed. And at that point, you know, it's just slowly picking up the load. Once the generator is up to speed and able to take it, then they'll shut off the utilities so the generator doesn't see that big pop punch. Uh, <coughs> power plants are commercial because it's yeah, the commercial right. yeah, ten seconds. Okay, minutes. so here's the deal, right? This <coughs> this 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 system is probably standby power. Yeah. Right? So we're trying to pick up the whole building with these two gens. Well, we have a life safety circuit somewhere. This right, CD. right, all the way to the end, the last one. Okay, the here's your life safety. So normally you'd have two breakers on this generator, right? feeding into the utility gear. We probably have breakers in the utility gear, so it's going to be redundant because a lot of times these generators are outdoor and this gear is indoor. And in code, once you enter the building, you have to have a certain disconnect again. So we're going to have a breaker for Gen 1, a breaker for Gen 2, and a breaker for utility. Okay. Um, so let's see. Gen so, one. so what happens is, is you have to pick up this life safety circuit over here. Well, code says you have to have this has to, once you lose utility, this has to be up and running within 10 seconds. The rest of the building could take 30 or 40 or whatever. It doesn't matter because it's standby. You're just trying to not have the whole building in the dark. So, you one of these two generators, you'll probably have to have a second breaker for life safety feeding this transfer switch over here. So, and I don't know which... Gen 1. Gen 1, okay. Gen one is and then you'll have a breaker from the utility side feeding that transfer switch. So here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> because generator 1 comes up to speed. It's feeding this transfer switch from the generator side, right? Transfers, boom, 10 seconds. Well, then a little bit later, now all of a sudden we're, we're on Gen 1, Gen 2 here. Power's back up from the normal side, but it's still a generator. Well, the transfer switch is going to switch to normal power, even though it's generator. Mm -hmm. But you just got to make sure that this gets up and running in 10 seconds. So you have to have a second breaker, and you have to have a separate ATS for your life safety. <clears throat> what happened is that in the past, is the generators, when they take a 4,000 amp switch gear, they cannot make the 10 seconds. Right, so you can't, they can't get them synced yeah, together in and online in 10 seconds. And seconds. pick up the emergency load. That's why they forced you to put that one. And that right. has always been a debate, is right. a waste. It is a waste. So the auto transfer switch really works only for probably 15 seconds, maybe a minute maximum. And then you're going back then to... Then it goes back to... Right. To um, gear. And then on this transfer switch, uh, you know, it depends on what we're doing with these generators out here, whether we're binding it as a... Are we se separately driving the system on the generators? These will be <coughs> non-separately drive systems. Okay, so... There's two options, right? On your when you're doing a generator, you can either bond the generator, the neutral, the ground at the generator, treat it as a service. Okay, at that point, because it's, it's got its own neutral and ground being derived here, this transfer switch has to be a four-pole transfer switch. In other words, you have to switch not only phases, but the neutral as well. 
Okay. Now, the other option is to run the grounds and the neutral from here back to the server. Once you do that, this is bonded. This is not a newly derived system at that point because it's, it's getting its ground and its neutral reference from the, the service gear over here. At that point, <coughs> this can be a threefold transfer switch. When you put them in the fluid gear, if it's physically derived system, you're going to end up with a four fold circuit breaker. Yep. I would be going to say, how often do you see that? Do we, we, do we do it. Um, we had a data center in North Minneapolis, OHDI. Um, four fold circuit breaker. Well, that, that job was a disaster because it was the first 400 volt data center for an area. AC? Right. Yeah, instead of doing PDUs and transforming down to 208, um, they were actually using 230, 400 volts. So they're using 230 volt. You know, nobody makes a 277 volt rated server, right? But they make a 240 volt server. So what we ended up doing was putting three auto transformers into a Y, so we're bringing 488 volts on the outside, and then just tapping off that way we're getting 400 volts to feed the load. So it was 230 slash 400 volt three phase four way. Well, to do that, we needed neutrals brought all the way down to the service because they weren't deriving a, a new system with the transformer. <coughs> with a normal data center where you have a PDU or something where you could transform it from 480 down to 208 or whatever, right? You only have to bring three phases in and then the transform to arrive the neutral and the secondary. So this could all be three wires stuck up here. So when you do that, then the ground fault system is very easy because there's no neutral path. So this one, we had to have we had three utilities. And 12 gens. We have mm -hmm. utility, gen, 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 utility, gen, 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 utility, gen, gen, gen. And all those neutrals were hooked up, and all of them were feeding down to the lows. Well, we had so many redundant neutral paths that the ground fault system was yeah. puking on itself. So we had to put in a whole bunch of four fold breakers to start switching the neutrals back and forth. So, yeah, we do make four fold breakers. We can incorporate in the gear if you bond it there. <coughs> in general, it's like a 25% add to the breaker price. It's 30. So it's not as bad as you think. For us, some people it's more. But uh, we could make this, you know, with four full breakers, and this could be bonded at that point. We could switch to neutrals, but it gets a little ugly, you know. <coughs> so normally, when you're doing this type of thing, you don't drive a system and and you just uh, use the service for the reference. Mm -hmm. Makes everything easier. Any questions on that? The other issue you have to worry about is now that. It's closed transition, right? So it means two gens and utilities are going to be tied together for a certain amount of time. What's that going to do to the short circuit rate in the gear? You know, the utility might have been 65k, so we could have used if it was open transition. We probably can use 65k rate of gear. Um, but being that it's closed transition, you got two gens, probably two big gens and utility tied together. Now you got to start adding up the fault currents from all these different devices. So the gens could be putting up 22k, right? Now all of a sudden we're looking at 44k plus 65. We might be at 100k or, or 125k on that gear, which makes this way more expensive. And you know, so there, there's some more differences, right? If you go open transition. You know, you probably could get away with 65k because the two gens tied together is less than 65, and the utility's probably 65. And we always, when we do a fault current study, 
We assume, assume worst case that that fault could definitely could occur when everything is connected together. And plus, you have to figure in all the motor loads over here feeds into that fault. So, you know, just some things to think about: open, close, short, new, you know, bonded, unbonded, all the things that affect the system. How are you guys doing? <laughs> Am I doing okay here? It's kind of what I have. Um, is there any questions? Do you guys have any questions for Jerry? I mean, I run this what stuff. This is what I eat, freeze all yeah. day long. It's they want to do. Stuff. They will be specifying like <coughs> 10 ohms and 480, 208, 120 panels. And then you have your catalog, which you want to just for a few seconds you walk them through the catalog. Yeah, we kind of um, went through that for the commercial. Yeah. Just for a second here. Yep. I do have not this slide. And I, I highlighted them too for you. So so do you guys want to grab your catalog for from two or three please? And don't say anything like this. Yeah, yeah, don't say <laughs> has Todd been here? We're, we're recording though. What's that? We're recording. <laughs> yeah, he was. What's he teaching? He did the power. Same thing. Oh, he already did this? No, not not this uh, not this semester. Oh, okay. Not this semester. Last semester. Got it. Like Todd, he did the. You can tell him that. <laughs> So, I'm assuming lighting panels is what we're dealing with. Yeah, right? we're not, lighting not distribution per se. Well, we have the highest pan. We have. Um, I'm assuming the busway is yes, serving well, the purpose well, of the, the distribution. The panels in them. We have uh, multiple sizes of panels. Anybody has a little shelf in front of them, guys? Yeah. Okay. So, what's the largest panel that we have? The MP1. Is it? How much? Yeah, 600. 600 and the largest panel, right? And how, what's the biggest breaker? 600. No, the bre feeder breaker. But you're not feeding uh, the bus. From, we have those panels, gotcha. Right? Um, 100 amps. 100 Most amps. of them okay. are feeding more. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the biggest breaker in this panel is 100 amps. So yeah. we'd be looking at a standard lighting panel at that yeah. point. So this, this MP1 would be our NF type panel board. Which, um, if you go to like a 9 13, that's where our uh, NF type panels start. Uh, normally, if it's being fed from this gear, this would be main lug only. Yep. Correct? Yep. So 600 amp main lug only. Uh, if you go to 9-13, nine, nine very top of the page, that first table, 9-9.46, or 9 those are main lug. And then you go down uh, to you hit 600 amp. And that just depends on how many circuits you need. Because now the code change, you know, before we were limited to 42 circuits up until the last code revision. Now they got rid of that. 42 circuit rule on panels. So now we have the ability to do a 30, a 42, a 66, or an 84 circuit panel. So it just depends on how many breakers you need and how many spaces. But but that's that would be the panel you'd want to use for the four-able panel. So it would be one of those at the bottom of, the uh, of that table. And that would be for all the <coughs> panels. We have uh, we have two panels, mechanical, and we have also a lighting panel that's 175 amps okay. or something. So these will be. So the 175 would be that same table, but slightly higher up. Yeah, same. And um, depends on how many circuits you need. Yeah. Again, we offer 30, 42, 54, 66. Everybody got that up sheet? Yeah. So that table would cover both of those, the LP and the MP1. And then on page, we're going to go backwards a little bit, uh, page 
Nope. 9-6 is where our NQ panels are located, and that would be the RP panel, your two-way panel. Um, again, since it's on the low, load side of the transformer, now that one's got to be main breaker. Um, so you'd be looking at the, let me see. Actually, you'd be looking at page 9-7 is where the main breaker panels and it will be the bottom part for the three phase four wire type. I'm assuming what's the KV of that transformer? Is it 75 or 45 or um, what, whatever it is, you know, whether it's a hundred amp or 225, um, it would be, you know, either of those panels shown. Uh, and again, it just depends on these spaces. Yeah, that's really the, the panels that we have. And yeah, it's your, pretty easy. Your, yeah. You know, the, I'm assuming you're going to have somebody come in and talk about the EPS. Is this a PDU or is this a... Is a PDU. So that would be a, a 480 EPS system and then and that then feeds... 480 and a 280 PDU. A PDU. Okay. And the PDUs would be basically a cabinet that has a transformer the panel all incorporated into it and then monitoring yep. alarming anything that's going on the panel it, basically it's just uh that's what it is it's a box with a transformer and a panel but then you have smarts so that you can monitor the load in each breaker that's in that panel any alarming that you need The riser there for the EPS panel. Yeah. Is that typically just going to be a normal panel board? This, that? Yeah. That's the actual UPS. Oh, that's the actual UPS. Mm -hmm. Right? Yep. Absolutely. I'm assuming it's a 4 a volt UPS, and that's what I was talking about before. You know, when you lose power to the system, anything fed off of this UPS would still maintain power because it's got the battery system that kicks in, and then the inverter. That converts that DC power into AC to power up the PUs and power up the loads downstream. You couldn't use that to hook it up to your emergency. No, because those batteries, those batteries, you have to size those batteries mm -hmm. for what the load is and for how long you want it to stay in line. And the bigger the load, or the longer you want to stay in line, the more batteries you need. Mm -hmm. So if we had to size this to pick up this whole thing, we might have a room this big full of batteries just to just to be able to keep that, you know, versus a generator, right? If you're waiting for the UPS to pick up the whole building until the generators came online, that could be. I was awesome. just thinking the emergency panel. Oh, over here. Yeah. I don't think they ever really well, for reason, some reason. Uh, <laughs> the, the the reason why they don't feed it from here, two things. Number one, the emergency load cannot share the batteries with any other load. So the UPS system is feeding money, feeding you to make business, not an emergency, number one. And number two, they size the battery for 15, 20 minutes yeah. versus the emergency panel should get to 83 minutes or something. So they, and if you were to size everything for 83 minutes, you have a lot of, <laughs> a lot you know, of money uh, in a big room because, yeah. the, you know, those batteries are huge. So uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Just remember when you're designing this that you're going to have two breakers on Gen 1. One to feed that feeds the gear and then a smaller one that's going to feed your, your ATS for your emergency. And those two breakers would have to be in separate enclosures. Okay, because code does say, can I write again? I think you can write it. Yeah. Um, you can want to write it on this, but give me a blank one. Here, we'll go back to this one. Okay, so this is my pretty picture. And um, so, say we just had one gem, and we're feeding, and we have a main lug only. Switchboard. So this is Gen 1, right? So you're going to have 4,000, no, 2,000 of them. 
right? Right, right because you have two gen yeah. versus a 4,000 yeah. amp server. So you're going to have a 2,000 amp breaker, standby power, into the utility grid. Now you have this light safety ATS over here, which is 100 amp maybe? Yep. Right? Depends on the building. 100 amp, and you're feeding that. Well, okay, this part falls under uh, Article 702, and it's standby power in the NEC. Well, this is emergency. That falls under Seven. 700, right? And then there's an optional uh, 701, which is legally required, which might be elevators, you know, stuff like that, right? But mm -hmm. legally required that you keep that power running in the building, but it doesn't necessarily fall into emergency. So you potentially could have three loads. This is uh, standby. This falls under 702. This could be elevators. And, and I don't know, fire pumps. What, mm -hmm. Do they fall under legal required mm -hmm. or do they fall under emergency? Legal required. Okay, okay, so that it could be elevators or fire pumps, and that's 701. And then you have your life safe, safety circuit at 700. Well, you could have a main LED switchboard, in, in, right? That's just a main LED. And now you have three breakers, but they're all in different sections of the code. Well, code says you have to physically separate your 700 from your 701 from your 702. So what that means is we can't just mingle them like this anymore. We would have to, and this is acceptable by code. This would be your main log only, right, MLO. Section with a 2,000 amp breaker being your standby. Barriers, steel barriers separating the structures. A section with a 200 amp breaker being your 701. And a section with a 100 amp breaker being your life safety. Now, if you had more emergency loads over here, you could keep. You know, putting breakers in here, and if you had, you know, we got an elevator, and now we're gonna, we have a fire pump that's 800 amps. As long as they're the same article, you can put multiple breakers in each section. But they physically, and we do have the ability to put steel barriers between sections. As long as they're barriered up, you can do this in one switchboard. Do they put a main and a gen then? Put a main and a gen. Yeah, put them in again. Yep. Or use six whisper like we're like mm -hmm. we're doing right now. Right. Or for your job, since it's really just mm -hmm. two, they may just put two right at the a, gen. a two thousand amp breaker and a hundred amp breaker with some separate enclosures beside each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'm just giving yeah. this for a what if mm -hmm. example. All right, I'm done. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have business cards for these young fellas. And not so young. We have some. If anybody. The B doc and mm -hmm. sure they take care of the 